Crypto is like finance, but different. It doesn't care when you invest, trade, or save. Do it on weekends, or at 5 a.m., or on Christmas Day at 5 a.m. Crypto is finance for everyone, everywhere, all the time. Visit kraken.com slash see what crypto can be to learn more. Not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S. territory customers by Payward Ventures, Inc. View PVI's disclosures at kraken.com slash legal slash disclosures. This week, we're airing some of our hottest topics of 2023, and it didn't get more feisty than a conversation we had about short-term rentals. Today on CityCast Las Vegas, we revisit a conversation with the people behind the Greater Las Vegas Short-Term Rental Association who are advocating for way less regulation. As late as 2021, unincorporated Clark County banned listings on platforms like Airbnb. That didn't stop an estimated 7,700 properties from doing it anyway. Then, the Nevada legislature passed a law requiring Clark County to allow it, which they did this year, but not without controversy. Our guests are behind a lawsuit, still pending in the Nevada Supreme Court, that argued the rules are still too strict. Meanwhile, only 830 operators, barely a tenth of the total, have bothered to apply for the new licenses. So what are the pros and cons of letting people rent out their personal houses in a motel model? And is the county playing fair when it comes to this hot button issue? It's Wednesday, December 27th. I'm David Figler, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. Jackie Flores and Louis Korndike, welcome to CityCast Las Vegas. Well, thank you for having us, and thank you for pronouncing my last name so well. Oh, well, you know, practice makes perfect. So today we're going to hit a hot button issue in our community. I know that a group that you're affiliated with engaged in a battle with the county over their rules for short-term rentals, and it's just gone up to the Nevada Supreme Court. Now, this comes after a district court ruled mostly in your favor about some of the provisions of the county's ordinance. The judge made the ruling, said that certain provisions were vague or unconstitutional, too much discretion to the county. And so the county right now is trying to, I guess, rewrite that ordinance to comply with the concerns that the judge had. They've, uh, they've proposed some amendments to the ordinance based on what the judge's ruling was. But, you know, we've looked at them and I don't think they're still doing a good job at it. Some of them are okay, but most of it is still not good enough. What What's not good enough? Well, I mean, the county just continues uh, to find ways to get people in trouble. Instead of doing the right thing and, and making it clear, like the judge asked, they continue to make this process convoluted and confusing for people. It sounds like you had a pretty definitive win that the judge went through every part of the ordinance as it was written and pointed out every part that was either too vague or too discretionary or unfair to the owner investors of of STRs. So why did you appeal? That's that's not that's actually not exactly true. The the judge did rule in our favor in a lot of points, but she only ruled in our favor in everything she read. Uh, she did not address everything. It was just too big. She even admitted right in the beginning. She said wow, this is going to go to the Nevada Supreme Court. I can tell you that right now. She said that in the very first trial. Everything she heard, she ruled in, and most all of it was in our favor. Everything else, she did not even touch. So well, we're what, basically, the, the the appeal is going from everything that she did not even touch on. Well, what did the judge not address that you wanted her to address? You have like the distance restriction, the lottery, the 1% cap. You know, those things, you know, the a number of licenses that can be owned by uh, by a person. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk about all those things. But for listeners, when you're referring to the one percent cap, that was a survey of sorts by the county 
to determine how many available housing units there are. And then they said that there can't be more than 1% of that or somewhere around 2,800 short-term rentals in unincorporated Clark County. Correct. That's correct. Okay. So something a lot of people in the Valley, myself included, are really concerned about are the rising rents and housing costs here. It's really expensive to live in Las Vegas and getting more expensive all the time. And I've seen studies that point to the role of STRs in the rents going up. For example, the Harvard Business Review did a study of absentee landlords, people who aren't there on the property or living there, and found that short-term rentals are responsible for 20% of the average increase in rent and 14% of the rise of home prices. So how do you counterbalance that downside of the impact on rents in the community? Honestly, I would say that's a just a complete fallacy and a flawed study. And I, like, I don't know what study you're reading, but more than likely that study was not conducted in Las Vegas. Most short-term rentals, especially these whole homes, these are very nice and fairly expensive homes. And they don't even come close to falling into the affordable housing or even affordable rent for that matter. I think that the other concept when you talk about affordable housing is just housing stock. So if you say there's 10,000 STRs in Clark County, uh, unincorporated Clark County operating right now, and if 2,800 get a license, that's 7,000 that would go back into the market with a different model. The estimated number of short-term rentals in unincorporated Clark County has always been around 10,000. Mm -hmm. That means that even before the pandemic, they were still around 10,000 short-term rentals. Can you tell me then why rent wasn't higher back then? The only reason why rent went crazy was because uh, after the pandemic, you had people that were working remotely and they started moving around. People started selling their houses in other places or leaving more expensive cities and moving to cities that were cheaper. That's what actually caused you know the issues with the housing, with rents going up and with houses uh, for sale going up in price, not short-term rentals. The number of short-term rentals has stayed steady over the years before the pandemic and before rents or house prices went up. Back then, they were blaming short-term rentals, claiming that short-term rentals actually affect communities and bring prices down. Now that the prices are up, all of a sudden now we're also responsible for that. Well, I'm not sure who they are. I think that the the common idea is that if you're living next to a short-term rental and it's not operated good, it's going to be hard for you to sell your house. But I, I think that the basic idea, though, is that if there's 7,000 houses in unincorporated Clark County that shouldn't be in this business model that people would then have to do something else with their houses, such as live in them or rent them to long-term renters or sell them to people who otherwise can't compete with these investors. When there's much bigger market forces at play here, all these home builders they're in business to employ people, to build houses, to sell houses, and to make a profit. They'll sell those houses to whoever wants to buy them. You should be oh, yeah, very sure. excited, you know, build houses, you know. I mean, I live out in Mountain's Edge, and it was supposed to be 100% built out in 2016. You look around here, it's not even halfway built out. So just pull the building permits, build houses. But bigger market forces are at play here. When there was cheap borrowing costs, everybody and their mother was trying to buy a house. And now that the borrowing costs came up, now you've seen the inventory is now here in the valley skyrocketing and they can't move houses. But there's also people buying one, two, three, four, five, ten houses. And I mean, that's just and all you know craziness. what? You got to be so excited to see. America and democracy and everything working where people can get ahead that way. Congratulations. It might not be good for me because maybe I want to compete a little bit. But unlike all the other markets, that's something else that's not being addressed at all. In the last four and a half months, we've lost more short-term rentals just due to market conditions than Clark County has been able to get rid of in five years. And this just goes to show you cannot have too many short-term rentals because then it just dictates the pricing. You have to continue to lower your price to remain competitive until it gets to the point where it's just not worth the effort. It already takes so much more work 
running a short-term rental and a long-term rental. And if there's too many short-term rentals, you can't compete. And so that is the free marketplace working itself out, keeping everything in check and in balance. So do you think that we should have any cap at all? I mean, should 50% of homes in residential neighborhoods be STRs if the free market says that that's what it should be? If the, well, first of all, the free market won't say that, but absolutely. The free market has always been able to dictate what works and doesn't work. Every time the government sticks their nose in it, you, they, they mess things up every time. Lewis, you have to agree with me that it'd be nice if people could live in homes or that a first-time family could buy a first-time home in our community. And right now, for whatever reason, and you know, some studies suggest that Airbnb-type rentals are part of the problem, um, that it's being kind of pushed away from their accessibility. I'm actually a first-time home buyer. The only reason I was able to afford that was because of Airbnb. How did that work? Well, because, I mean, when you are able to rent it out on Airbnb, you're able to make enough money to be able to meet all your expenses, the mortgage, the bills, and everything else. So, you know, doing a short-term renting allows people to actually get into their first home. I'm trying to figure that out, though. You got your first home, and then while you were living there, you were renting out a room in it? Right. Oh, okay. Well, that's a home different share. thing. That's like an owner-occupied thing. And from my and it's home still, share. It's still a short-term rental, yeah. right? And what I understand, and there's a lot of people who do the home share. That That's a very different situation than an absentee landlord or an investor or a corporation, isn't it? Shouldn't there be a distinction? Well, but what do you mean when you're talking about a corporation? Because this is something that gets thrown out, you know, out there mm -hmm. only because a property is owned by an LLC. I mean, I could put my house in an LLC. I'm not a corporation. I mean, it just because, you know, I put it on an LLC. A corporation will be like BlackRock. I mean, BlackRock is not going to buy two houses or three houses. They're going to buy, obviously, hundreds of houses at the same time. Then it doesn't make sense for the county to put this cap of people only being able to get one license because that's just, you know, that's affecting average folks, average people that are trying to make ends meet. It seems like, you know, the, the government officials want to pin this issue of affordable housing on short-term rentals when it's actually the government who can fix that issue. The government has the power to open up more land, to give out permits, to actually create incentives for people to build affordable housing. And they don't do that. Every time they, they try to make an effort to do affordable housing in a community, the first people that are up in arms about not wanting to have affordable housing in their neighborhoods are, the, are usually the same people that are claiming that we are, you know, we're affecting affordable housing. The NIMBYs. Yeah. Yes. And as Jackie <laughs> okay. mentioned earlier, you touched on the fact that pre-pandemic, pandemic now, we've stabilized at around 10,000 short-term rentals. It has not skyrocketed 20 or 30,000. The market doesn't, won't support it. The market's actually having a little bit of a difficulty being able to control 10,000 or make it profitable. It's always stayed the same. Does that become problematic, Lewis? Like, let's say that the, the competition's too high. What do the people who have invested in a house to make it a short-term rental do if nobody's renting it out? The same Wouldn't thing. Wouldn't it then just go back on the market and then potentially be bought by people who could live there? It, it may be, right. And that is one of the reasons why the inventory is skyrocketing. We did lose a lot of short-term rentals. We've actually lost a couple thousand in the last four or five months due to market conditions. And that's helping add to the inventory. And, and the inventory is continually growing right now. Dr. Macchiarini, he's the best in the world. Starring Edgar Ramirez and Mandy Moore. I take a 3D printed trachea and transform it into a living organ. It's still an extremely experimental procedure. Based on a breathtaking true story. She's sitting there with a bloody time bomb in her throat. What did you do to them? Something's not right. Dr. Death. New Doctor. New Story. Stream the Peacock Original Series now. Well, let's skip to some of the other topics that you guys raised. Distance requirements. So the law passed by the state requires 660 feet at a minimum between short-term rentals, which is technically, I believe, a city block. The county for unincorporated has raised that level to 1,000 between uh, short-term rentals. 
Is there any point, though, where there could be too many, in your opinion, short-term rentals in one neighborhood? Well, it sure, yes, from a competitive standpoint. For me, hey, if I was doing short-term rentals like I'm just allowed to do it, um, everybody else would have a problem because, again, you can only support so many short-term rentals. And I would consider myself an outstanding operator that gives a lot of value for your money and I'm an ambassador to the city. Anybody else that's not able to live up to my standards, I'm going to shut you down basically because I'm going to outcompete you, outvalue you, and you won't be able to compete against me. As it should be, right? Mm -hmm. They should have the opportunity to compete, right? Everybody should have that opportunity. But the way it's set up now, the government is picking the winners and losers. I'm in the city of Las Vegas. Okay. So there's licensed Airbnbs. There's a giant one right across from my house. And I'm just going to say this. I love them. They are great neighbors. I know them. They're owner-occupied, wonderful people. And I have no issue with it whatsoever. There are also unlicensed Airbnbs or short-term rentals um, that are nearby. There's like four or five of them that maybe everyone knows within within that 660 feet. Mm -hmm. I live in a neighborhood where we have neighborhood issues, traffic issues, community standards, livability in my neighborhood. I love getting together with my neighbors and we meet each other. We talk to each other about how we want to address issues with the city who we're also fighting all the time. We all know each other and we look out for each other. When there are strangers constantly coming into our neighborhood on a high turnaround basis, we're concerned that that type of community is being dissipated. And that's why we wanted to live in this neighborhood in the first place. But I think that the more short-term rentals that are in there, the less likely that is. And especially living in a nice, quiet neighborhood that's being advertised to STRs off the apps, that's rough. That's rough. So you, so you think they should be excluded just because you don't know them or just because they're strangers? Oh, I think I think my concern is that there should be a limitation on how many there are because it changes the character of the neighborhood and the neighborhood character is very important for livability and safety. Well, David, welcome to America. See, the Constitution was written to protect the average citizen from a thought process such as yours, where you think that you should have the right to trample over other civil liberties because you have your own idea of what a neighborhood should be. If you wanted to enjoy all those extra rules and regulations, you would have to buy into that and pay HOA dues. And that's how HOAs came about. It wasn't to be what your idea of what your character of a neighborhood should be. And that's why HOAs came about. But I think it's a pretty reasonable expectation that if you live in a residential area, that it that there are components of safety and people looking out for each other. I don't think that's totally unreasonable. But also, we elect representatives to pass laws that we support. And that's what elections go. There was the, the David, county, going David, back to the David, county. I'm sorry, well, no, David. I have to interrupt you. I absolutely have to interrupt you right there. Because, no, that is not the government's role. That never was the government's role. That's why the Constitution was written to keep the government from overstepping their authority in that manner. I mean, that's what zoning is, right? Again, you're speculating on who's running these houses and you're making it look like, for some reason, tourists are dangerous. And there is absolutely no No, data, not dangerous. They're David. unfamiliar. They're okay, unfamiliar with unfamiliar. areas. unfamiliar. Whatever. They want to and live like a local. And constantly turn over. And yeah. that's not true. See, here's the deal. A short-term rental operator has far more control over their property than a long-term operator. In fact, me renting properties out for over 20 years, most of that time was long-term rentals. All my problems, every last one of them, were with long-term rentals and not short-term rentals. Every neighbor complaint I had with my tenant that had a year or two lease was they didn't like the neighbors and they were partying all the time. And guess what? There was not a darn thing they could do about it, I could do about it, or the police could do about it because it was simply allowed. Now, as a short-term rental, you break my rules and regulations, I get to simply call the platform in which they booked on and they cancel the reservation and they're out. 
good luck trying to do that with a long-term tenant. Jackie, what do you think about that? Well, um, you have to also understand that the platforms have a review system that we uh, use. And that review system lets you know what type of guests you're going to be having or is trying to rent your house. So that kind of let, alerts us you know, to whether we should be renting to that person. And I can tell you that I'm not going to rent to somebody that was you know, making noise or destroying the property or creating any types of issues. I'm not going to let that person rent my property. So I get to decline that request. Well, let me just ask this as a final question. What regulations do you think would satisfy everybody? Basically, all the nuisance laws are already on the books, whether it's the noise ordinance, trash ordinance, indecent exposure. All those nuisance laws are on the books. You don't need to create a whole new set of laws based on how long you're staying at the property. Just because you're staying at the property for 27 days doesn't mean a certain set of rules apply to you, whereas 31 days, it does not. So let me ask you this, Lewis. If a property got three nuisance citations, should they be disallowed from continuing as a short-term rental operator? I believe Would that, that be a solution that you would buy I, off on? I would believe that is beginning to show a pattern uh, and maybe you're beginning to see an operator that doesn't know what they're doing or taking it seriously. But you also got to be careful when they put certain laws and regulations in effect, especially for neighbors that don't like the idea, you're weaponizing the neighbors so they can start turning you in for ridiculous things at all. What if they were like convictions for nuisance? So they would have to go through the legal process. I, I would say that's a very reasonable request. I mean, look the, at that. We're doing it, Lewis. We're finding them. Uh, of <laughs> I course. love it. No, 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 no. We're not. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I probably gave because I'm very passionate on the subject and I don't sure. want to give the the impression that oh no, we just, you know, throw caution to the wind, everything goes. But you also have to understand the fact that Clark County, we've been under an assault, nonstop assault. And anybody with a reasonable amount of intelligence that would look how Clark County approached this whole thing, it has never been about working with us. It's only been about punishing. And yes, I I really do believe you are right you know, there are things that need to be put in place. We're not against everything. We just want to recognize the fact we would like a seat at the table. We would like to have honest conversations. We would like to recognize the fact there are already all the nuisance laws on the books. You know, nobody wants to have problem renters. As a short-term rental owner, the last thing they want is to have somebody that's renting the property is going to destroy it. They put so much money into it. You know, it's not just their life savings you know, to be able to have a short-term rental. Well, we're going to wrap it right there then. We'll see what the county does. We'll see what the Supreme Court does. And I want to thank you both for taking the time to talk with us. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, the time. Thank you. Thank you for having us. That's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more of our recap of the biggest stories from this year. Happy holidays. This week, this week, this week, this week we're airing some of, this week we're airing, oh my God, I got that.